Hi, my name is Garrett McDermott. I'm a clinical neuropsychologist working at Tally University Hospital, and I'm also the secretary of the Division of Neuropsychology in PSI at the moment. I was invited to put together this video to try to provide some information for undergraduate students in psychology who may be thinking about a career in clinical neuropsychology in the future. And I'd like to thank um, Dr. Jennifer O'Mahony from the Washford Institute of Technology for extending that information, that invitation to me and for providing me with some direction and some, some thoughts around the kind of information that undergraduate students might be interested in. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Nick Kidd and Dr. Marsha Ward for their, their thoughts and their support in putting this together and so for some earlier versions of these slides as well. I think the place to start here is by thinking about what is neuropsychology. Um, and, and when you're looking that up, you're always going to come across definitions along the lines of, you know, you know it's the study of the way the brain and behaviour relate to each other, those kind of associations. And that's very much true. It's a very important idea to, I suppose, to hold in mind. Within neuropsychology, I think there are, there are a number of important distinctions. And one of them, probably one of the most important ones, is the distinction between cognitive and clinical neuropsychology. So cognitive neuropsychology is that endeavor that really aims to help us understand brain function, particularly cognitive uh, functioning, social cognitive functioning, and so on. And, and it really aims to help us develop a really nuanced understanding of that. Clinical neuropsychology, on the other hand, uh, is about the application of this kind of information and psychological models um, to helping people with neurological problems. And it's probably what most people think of when they say neuropsychology. And the two of these have a lot of interplay between each other and, and always have, although, although in, I guess they are separate endeavors. And they've, they've really helped us have a very nuanced and subtle way of understanding the brain. And, you know, a lot of our findings from that have really made it into the mainstream media. So, so you, you know, that's kind of everywhere. It's really, really important information. And um, neuropsychology really aims to understand how the structure and the function of the brain relate to specific psychological processes and behaviors and how we can use that information to help people with, say, neurological problems or neurodevelopmental conditions. And you might ask, why, why do we think it's important? Well, I suppose on the one hand, it is estimated that there are around about 800,000 people living in Ireland with a neurological condition and 40,000 people a year are diagnosed. Now, not all of those people are going to be in need of neuropsychology or psychology generally, but many of them will be. And we know that neuropsychology can really help contribute to understanding the impact of a neurological condition on somebody's life, how it impacts their cognitive functioning, their emotional functioning, their social well-being, and so on. And we know that well-placed neuropsychology and also general psychology can really help to improve quality of life. On the other hand, we also know that the brain and brain health are very, very important in this day and age, particularly as we help to try to combat and, and work against, for example, the risk of things like developing dementia later. In, in working as a neuropsychologist, people do frequently ask us, you know, what, what do you do? What, what, what is the work of a neuropsychologist? So, you, you, you know, we know what neuropsychology sort of is, but what is it you do? And I have to say that there are a whole load of different thoughts in this, and everybody seems to have a slightly different thought, some of which might be accurate, some of which not so much. Um, so one of the things I really want to impart today in this sort of video is that neuropsychology is a very, very varied career. Clinical neuropsychology is, is very, there are many parts to it. And I suppose a neuropsychologist in one setting is not necessarily doing the same things as a neuropsychologist in another setting. But in very broad terms, we're supposed to be specialists in the application of, of, of psychology and psychological theories and models to working with people with neurological conditions. And we would apply this sort of advanced understanding to help us in, in the processes of assessment and um, contributing to diagnosis and formulation and the treatment or intervention or therapy with people with neurological conditions, as well as rehabilitation. We serve people across the lifespan. So neuropsychology is not specifically dedicated to a particular age range. We, we really do work with people of all ages. And in fact, that variety I mentioned of really comes through here because another distinction to think of here is the difference between pediatric neuropsychology and adult neuropsychology. And increasingly it's recognized that these are two distinct uh, avenues through neuropsychology with distinct skill sets. And I think I would probably add in as well, working with older adults, it might be, it might be another distinct skill set there. On a day-to-day -day basis, the role itself is also very varied, what we actually do. We're probably known for neuropsychological assessments. So these are the in-depth assessments of cognitive functioning. And I'm going to say a little bit more about those in just a couple of minutes. 
But across the week, we also do things like one-to-one -one therapy or group therapy. So for example, maybe helping somebody come to terms with life following an acquired brain injury or a stroke, or adjusting to a diagnosis of, of a progressive condition, like something like multiple sclerosis. We may also run group therapies. I have a colleague, for example, where I work, who runs group uh, interventions for people um, through, through, through a migraine service. And we're also can be heavily involved uh, in both one-to-one -one and group cognitive rehabilitation, often drawing heavily on the neuropsychological assessment, which of course draws heavily on the cognitive neuropsychological uh, theories and models. We may be offering a lot to families of people uh, developing neurological conditions and, and neurodevelopmental conditions. Um, we might be engaged in supervision of other professions, helping others, uh, other psychologists, for example, to develop neuropsychology competencies. Or we might be involved in service development, so, so building the services we're in to reflect neuropsychological and psychological principles and to build these into the pathways in an integrated way. Um, we're very often involved in developing the discipline of neuropsychology itself. It, it's true to say that it's quite a small profession in Ireland, and, and I think we could, we could fairly say that it's quite under, underdeveloped so far. Um, we might do a lot of talking, teaching, lecturing, speaking at conferences as well to try to help um, spread neuropsychological learning and to develop the practice, our practices further, as well as engage in research. And again, that interplay between um, clinical and cognitive neuropsychology might be at play there, as well as moving into very clinically orientated neuropsychological research. I think that there's application or there's potential application for neuropsychology across the healthcare spectrum. So across all healthcare settings, wherever we think psychology can fit in, I would suggest that we probably imagine that neuropsychology could fit in there too. But when we look around us, we know that it's not quite that well developed in Ireland just yet. And looking around, these are the kinds of places that neuropsychologists do actually work at the moment. So in Ireland, probably the bigger number of neuropsychologists work in acute hospitals or general hospitals. We might work, for example, in neurology departments. That's what I do myself. We might work in neurosurgery departments or in stroke services in acute hospitals. Neuropsychologists all also work in post-acute tertiary centres um, involved in specialist input for people as they move past the acute stage. So, for example, services like the National Rehabilitation Hospital. Neuropsychologists are likely to be employed in specialist community services that provide specialist input for people with specific uh, conditions, such as services such as Acquired Brain Injury Ireland or Headway Ireland, who both provide very valuable services across the country for people with acquired brain injury. You may also see neuropsychologists cropping up in HSE services, um, perhaps less so than we should, because at present, uh, neuropsychologist is not actually a recognized um, job title within the HSE per se. However, many people working within um, older adult services in the HSE, within mental health services, and indeed in some of the disability services, um, would um, in fact have neuropsychology training. And I think there's a lot of developmental potential there for down the line. In fact, thinking about uh, mental health services, it would be very useful in my opinion to have neuropsychology at least embedded in those networks. Looking around Ireland, you might also find neuropsychologists in community neuro rehab teams. Of course, the qualification there would be that at present, there are very few neuro rehab teams in Ireland. So this is another area that we expect great development in the coming years. And neuropsychologists, of course, fit in very, very, very well within rehabilitation services in general. So I suppose the message is we fit in in a lot of places, but there's a lot of work to do to, to, to bring us up to the kind of level that we, we should have in this country. So what's the job itself like? Well, you know, uh, you, you know, a, a personal reflection, I suppose. Um, I, I guess I find it to be a very interesting and very rewarding profession to work in. Uh, I think it's very, it's very varied. I think I may have communicated that already. There's a, there's a lot going on. Um, a lot of psychologists and neuropsychologists included will, will tell you that our work really bestows a great privilege on us, you know, and um, people invite us into their lives and we get to know people in a particular way. And that is an incredibly rewarding and special role to have. Um, it is always a challenge. So if you're, if you're someone who likes a challenge, you're up for that challenge of constantly learning. Psychology and clinical neuropsychology are certainly, uh, are certainly going to check those kind of boxes. And then there are some wonderful people at work in healthcare services in Ireland today, multi-professional colleagues, as well as some of our, our psychology colleagues. And within the Division of Neuropsychology, we may not be a cool group, but we are a pretty interesting group and a pretty nice group of people. Is there a downside to that? Well, um, you, you know, uh, there's, there's, there, it can be hard work. You know, it's, it's not an easy job, I suppose. Perhaps no job is easy. It's called work for a reason. 
Um, but but neuro neuropsychology certainly is challenging. Uh, and it's, 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 it's a long training road to get there. And that certainly puts hurdles up for some people. Um, we carry a lot of responsibility, not just in neuropsychology, but I guess across healthcare services. And, and many of us would take that really very seriously. And that can be something that weighs on us, particularly when we consider that in, 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 in some regards, some parts of the healthcare system, uh, the services and facilities are, are far from ideal. So we might be looking at lack of resources, um, understaffing, um, lack of space, uh, and, and, and maybe not the full skill mix. And, 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 and that can contribute to things like poor patient experience, long waiting lists and so on. And that, that can weigh heavily on us. But those are, I suppose, pretty generic kind of criticisms within the healthcare system. The role of clinical neuropsychologists itself, I think really is one that, 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 one that really brings a lot for the practitioner. Um, to try and illustrate it a little bit further, I thought I'd, I'd give you a sense of, of uh, a day in the life. So, so a, a day out of my diary, and this actually does reflect a real day in my diary. So I looked at my diary and I chose a Monday from a little while ago. Um, there's a lot of variety, as I keep saying. Um, I do different things on different days. So this doesn't paint a picture of the rest of my week, but it gives you a sense of what Monday is like. So I tend to arrive to work just before 8 a.m. Um, that kind of suits me, you know, thinking of my work-life balance. I, I happen to be a morning person. I happen to do some of my best work earlier in the day. Um, so it suits me to come in a little bit earlier. I'm trekking across town to get to work. So that suits me in terms of traffic and parking. And some of those really concrete, almost mundane things are, are sort of important here. Among the first things I do are, well, I put the kettle on, I get a cup of tea, uh, and then I check email. So there is always loads of email. Um, in my setting, it's particularly important that I'm on top of that regularly because I actually get my inpatient referrals via email. So on a Monday morning, I really need to make sure that I'm on top of anything that may have happened or been communicated, sent my way since Friday afternoon when I left. Um, so I'll use the first hour of the morning to do those things. And I will also be preparing um, for, for my morning clinic. So on Mondays, I do what I call my therapy clinic, in which I see around about three people back to back. Now, for me and for a lot of psychologists, that's a pretty intense morning. It's, it's, it's not very light. Um, but this is, uh, this is what works for me. Um, so on the particular day that I chose, uh, the three people I saw, I won't say very much about them, but just to say the first person I saw was a young woman who'd been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis uh, within the last year um, and had uh, really developed some very intense anxiety experiences. And I've been seeing her for a little while now. We're probably coming to the end of this work in relation to anxiety about the future and what it holds and what MS means for her, but also some panic attacks in there. So we've been doing a little bit of intervention about that. The second person I saw then was um, a person who presents with non-epileptic attack disorder. So this was someone I actually initially engaged with a few months back uh, as an inpatient. And we've been meeting every, every few weeks uh, to try to, to, to work on providing some education for this person around what, what, what non-epileptic attacks are and some ideas on how they may be able to improve them. So, so we're kind of in the middle of a piece of work there. And the third person I, I, I met with on this particular day was someone diagnosed with functional neurological disorder. So this was a person who attended, again, the hospital with um, s signs and symptoms that look neurological in, in, in origin, but the doctors find there to be um, uh, no structural uh, process underlying these, these symptoms. In this case, the person had presented with uh, a tremor and a weakness on one side, uh, a slight droop in their face and some slurred speech. So of course, the initial question was, has this person had a stroke? But ultimately, all the tests and investigations concluded uh, concluded otherwise. And in fact, getting into it with this person, they, 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 they pretty readily uh, understood um, where things might have been coming from. So we've been, we've been working on that recently. And then I take lunch, uh, very important. I'm a real stickler for that. I, I, I need to eat, I'm, I'm not great when I don't eat, um, but also I need, I need headspace away from it. And that is a pretty intense Monday morning for me, I have to say, um, being, being present for, 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 the, for, for each of the, 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 the patients or the people coming into me really, really can take a lot. So I have to stop. Now, Monday happens to be a day that my colleague working in the migraine service is, is on site. So on this day, I went for, for lunch with my colleague. And we had an old natter about the weekend and we looked at some changes upcoming in the migraine service. Back to the office about one for, uh, about 12 45 i'd say uh, and i usually leave 30 to 45 minutes at this point um to try and catch up on things maybe catch up on notes from the morning again back into the email um, and just seeing what needs to be done and on this particular day i needed to link in with uh, the senior neurophysiotherapist in relation to uh, a mutual client uh, and a little bit of admin my afternoon clinic on a monday is a cognitive clinic which means i'm going to be doing these neuropsychological assessments um, and depending on the week, the, that will take a different form. So I might be doing interviews uh, over the phone, taking the background and speaking to, to, to say, uh, um, the person's 
family members to get a sense of what's going on, or I might be meeting with the person in order to do the in-depth testing. And on this day, I happened to be meeting with the person who, in fact, I had met once before as an inpatient. So I had a sense of, of how things were for her. And the question here was really about whether we thought there, was, uh, there were signs of an emerging dementia. So that wrapped up uh, around about maybe 3.15, and I spent a bit of time then on the admin scoring the tests and getting my head around what was going on there. Uh, and then after that, what I would typically do is I would be winding down from four o'clock on most days, uh, although that depends on the day of the week, um, catching up on notes, preparing for the following day, which in this case was important because actually a referral for an inpatient had come in and I have inpatient time available uh, ring fenced for me on, on Tuesdays. Uh, and I also needed to link in with a consultant that afternoon. So that's a, a reasonable snapshot of what I do on a Monday. It doesn't illustrate what I do on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, and, it, and it probably is one of the, the, the tighter days for me. There's a lot going on on a Monday, um, but that's, that's the Monday and, and how it is. And again, that gives that sense of the variety of the different things that I'm doing. Now, I wanna talk a little bit more about those neuropsychological assessments, um, because again, one of the key co competencies within the skill set of the neuropsychologist. Um, so uh, Jonathan Evans uh, defines it as a uh, neuropsych assessment as being concerned with identifying the cognitive, social, emotional and behavioural consequences of brain dysfunction. And it's really used to answer numerous questions. And, and that would be very true. I won't dive into that in any detail, but just, just to give a little context. So the neuropsychologist would be someone who is, is going to assess some of the things on the screen here in depth. So the likes of memory, attention, visual spatial skills, language uh, in, in depth, try and get a sense of what's going on for the person responding to, to, to the particular questions that we might be answering. So are these things development, are, are, they deve are there developmental difficulties going on here influencing these things? Or maybe has there been a sudden abrupt change such as a TBI or a stroke? Or is there kind of a, a change over time that might indicate some kind of an emerging dementia process. These are all the kinds of questions that different neuropsychologists might be looking at. And I guess we all know that different parts of the brain are involved in different functions and they're, they're all hooked into different networks that do different things. And one of the roles of the neuropsychologist is to test some of these things out using reliable and valid methods. So we have a whole host of tests and tools and instruments and measures that we can deploy in a hypothesis driven way. So when we have a sense of what's going on, we begin to do tests to try to get information to weigh those hypotheses up so that we can ultimately develop a neuropsychological formulation, which in some cases will contribute to the diagnostic process. I would suggest that probably all professionally qualified psychologists do a cert, do, do assessment and they certainly would do a certain amount of testing. Um, but I guess neuropsychology is, is the arena in which this is often seen as particular part of the specialism. So how, how do we develop those competencies? How does somebody move from the undergraduate stage right up to doing these things that I've been talking about? Well, it's a long road. And I know that it's been quite unclear in Ireland for, for many years. There hasn't been a really clear cut pathway. So if you're not certain, that's not on you. It really has been uncertain. But I've tried to lay out just the, the main steps in that long process. The first one really is getting that core degree in psychology. You cannot practice as a psychologist in Ireland unless you have a psychology degree or indeed a conversion degree. The next step for people around about that undergraduate stage, people in undergraduate or recent graduates, it's really to be thinking about pursuing professional training in psychology. Until relatively recently, clinical neuropsychology was seen as a specialism or, or a subspecialism of clinical psychology. I think we recognize nowadays that it more is an additional set of competencies on top of those core professional training. So what that says is the journey post undergraduate uh, uh, degree really is towards, in the first instance, professional psychology training and everything that that entails. Now, I'm not here to, to go into what clinical and counselling and educational psychology are, but they are the absolutely crucial milestone on the journey to becoming a clinical neuropsychologist. Once one trains in professional psychology, which is to doctoral level, uh, to become a neuropsychologist, the, the, a clinical neuropsychologist, the next two steps, which can happen concurrently, are to develop a sufficient knowledge base in clinical neuropsychology and to develop your clinical practice skills working clinically under supervision. So you're working as a qualified psychologist with a neuropsychologically relevant group of people or in that kind of way. Now back to this stage, this undergraduate into professional training uh, direction. A lot of people at undergraduate level who, who ultimately want to do neuropsychology, people will know that. People will have a sense that, yeah, that's the direction I want to go. And if that's you, this really is a time to start thinking about it. As you're making choices over the next few years, indeed, even in the course, 
about your, your different modules, you can be thinking, okay, I can, I can lean into these things a little bit. Um, if, you're not, if you're someone who's only discovering the interest in neuropsychology much later, that's also absolutely fine. And we regularly see that in our neuropsychology colleagues. Not everybody knows from day one. And the message I really want to give here is, although this is long and probably a little bit daunting, it is absolutely doable. It is absolutely doable with support. And there are a number of groups out there that can help people progress in professional psychology. So within the Psychological Society of Ireland, for example, there's the Student Affairs Group and the Early Graduate Group. There are the different um, resources available within the different um, educational institutions. And then there's the likes of ourselves in the Division of Neuropsychology. As well as, I suppose, because people are, are, are pursuing training in professional, uh, the, the professional training in psychology, there's also the groups aimed at supporting people to become clinical psychologists and counseling psychologists and educational psychologists. So I want to go into that relevant experience and knowledge base piece a little bit more. Um, it, 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 there's, there's no set formula to this and no two people do it in the same way. There, there are very... There are a lot of very um, varied stories and diverse stories as to how people enter psychology and pursue training in psychology and move towards something like clinical neuropsychology. And what I would say is that all experience relevant to working in psychology is relevant to working in neuropsychology. And I would also personally hold that to be true in reverse. All, neuro, all experience relevant to neuropsychology really is relevant to the likes of clinical and counseling and educational psychology. We've got to think about the core competencies here. What is the role of psychologists and how do we build up that profile in those early years? It can seem really daunting and it can seem really competitive at times, which is a real downside to it. Um, the kinds of jobs that people take are jobs as assistant psychologist, research assistant. And I suppose those are the two that most people would be after. If you know already that neuropsychology is a direction you want to go in, well, why not keep your eye open for options within the neuro-related field or the disability-related field? Um, however, working as a rehabilitation assistant, a healthcare assistant, working in advocacy, there are many, many, many other roles that will be relevant. It's all about using those opportunities to develop your skills and to be exposed to psychology and to be thinking about how you can take the learning from the, set, the settings that you're in and continue to use it to develop your own reflective practice and your own skill base. Where possible access and clinical supervision is really important as well. So if that's available within the organization you're working in, by all means, try to, try to, to access that. I would say that if you know that neuropsychology is for you, it's about thinking about the electives, even in undergraduate, that might be relevant. Cognitive psychology, all your biopsychology, neuropsychology, disability studies, and so on and so forth. Thinking about how they might be able to stack up and help you have the profile that you might want down the line. But bearing in mind that none of these decisions are forever. There's always opportunities within in this kind of long, rich, varied profession to change that. Um, thinking about postgraduate programs, the truth is when we're in that stage of moving from undergraduate towards professional psychology training, most people, if not all, at this stage will probably do a master's degree and some will even go as far as a PhD. And that's a big commitment. Both of those are a big commitment and can be really difficult to choose. And what I would say to you is a piece of advice I once received from, from a former supervisor of my own, which was when you're making these kind of choices, make sure that you're doing it to, to, to benefit in, in what you're doing as well. It's not just always about the end point of the journey, because one of the wonderful things about progressing through psychology education and training is that so many doors that you never expected open en route. So making the decisions to work for you now rather than a hypothetical future is also something that's really, really important. I want to do a final plug for the Division of Neuropsychology, if you're still listening. Um, and I just want to say that we're, we're open to all members of the Psychological Society of Ireland. So anybody who's a member of PSI with any form of membership can join as an associate member. And we would really encourage people to do it. And in thinking of the kind of things that might be relevant for, for undergraduates or people in the earlier stages of their career, you know, the Division of Neuropsychology has an annual um, early career award for, for those researching in, in psychology. And we would regularly have entrance from people with their undergraduate projects, their master's projects, and indeed some doctoral projects. So we've been doing that the last couple of years. We also have regular grand rounds events, which we run on Zoom. So these are free to, event, free to attend events in which a qualified psychologist or neuropsychologist 
will present a case based on their own work. So some of these cases are quite complex, but they give you a real flavor of what we do and the challenges, the challenges that we might face. And we hope that they provide a good opportunity to get to know people, so that kind of networking opportunity, but also a good development opportunity, learning opportunity. So they are pitched for people with a background knowledge, but they're certainly open to people uh, in the earlier stages of their career. And then finally, the Division of Neuropsychology also runs other events throughout the year, many of which will be relevant and certainly open to, to, to um, undergraduate uh, students as well. Um, and I've just got some advertisements up there from some, some of the recent events that we did. So looking at the use of technology within neuropsychology, looking at cognitive behavioral therapy for PTSD after acquired brain injury, um, and an upcoming event, which is around maximizing capacity in the context of the Assisted Decision Making Act. So I'd just like to thank you for, for your attention throughout this video, if you've stuck with me, and I would encourage you to engage with the, 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 the Division of Neuropsychology if you're interested on both Twitter and uh, Instagram. And, uh, and good luck in your training. I really do hope that this uh, video has answered at least some of the questions that you might have and has been uh, of relevance to you as, uh, as, as you consider your future options. Thanks a million.